Amongst the many creatures, Icelanders believed they inhabited the land were trolls. In Icelandic lore and legends, there are numerous stories of trolls and their interactions with humans throughout the centuries or ever from the time Iceland was settled in the middle of the 9th century. In the cosmology and religion of the Nordic people, prior to them adopting Christianity, which occurred around the year 1000, there was plenty of room for ogres, giants and trolls and other creatures. Each one of those species of gargantuan subhumans had its own peculiarities and distinctive features that today have melted together into blurry images in the mind of modern man, where sizes and nature vary a great deal. Contributing to those fuzzy ideas is the ongoing effort of modern society to soften their image of the trolls and even reduce them to small, cuddly and funny-looking creatures that are completely benign and non-threatening. So tonight I want to examine and identify some of the unique features of Icelandic trolls and perhaps recount a few stories that may give us a better understanding of them. First we want to find out where the word troll actually comes from. It is related to the Icelandic word trilla, which means to become mad with rage. Their name is a true expression of the core of the troll's character. Their first response to everything seems to be that of rage. And therefore they are considered extremely dangerous. Their size and physical strength makes them so dangerous that even, even to themselves that they would never form communities of any kind. They live mostly by themselves in caves high up in the mountains, far from anyone else. And finding mates to procreate and keep the race from extinction is a constant problem. Much can be learned about trolls from the story of Baruður, the Snæfell's house, the part of Snæfell's nest. The saga of Baruður draws on legendary material and the authoritative books of Heimskringla and Landnáma. Baruður's mother was a human, but his father was a half-giant and half-troll. His father was fostered by Dobre, the mountain dweller of Dobrafjall in Norway. By his first wife, Dobre's daughter, Flömgerður, who also had a human mother, Bárður had three tall, beautiful daughters, Helga, Thortis and Guðrún. By his second wife, Herthrúður, who was a human, he had six more daughters. Bárður and his wife, and his daughters emigrated to Iceland and came ashore at a lagoon on the south shore of Snæfellsnes, which they named Dubalo, the deep lagoon. There he built himself a farm which he called Laugarbrekka. Thorkell, Bárður's half-brother from his mother's second marriage to a giant, lived at Arnarstabi. And he had two sons, Rødfeldur, the Red Cloak, and Sölvi. The sons of Thorkell and the daughters of Bárður used to play together. One day, when there was a pack ice along the shore, Rødfeldur pushed Helga, daughter of Bárður, out to sea on an iceberg. She drifted unharmed all the way to Greenland, and there she found a lover. But Bárður was infuriated. He pushed Rødfeldur into Rødfeldsgjá ravine and threw Sölvi of Sölva Hamar, a high cliff on the coast east of Arnastabi. It is said that Bárður and Thorkir fought, 
and Thorkel's leg was broken, which caused him to move out of the district. But after these events, Bárður gave away his land and vanished into the ice cap of Snæfellsjökull, assuming that his trollish nature made him unfit to dwell any longer amongst the humans. He became known as Bárður Snæfellsás, because, as they would say, they practically worshipped him on the peninsula and called upon him in times of difficulty. For many he also proved to be a source of real help in need. He wandered the region in grey call with a walrus hide rope around him and a cleft staff in his hand with a long thick gap, which he used when walking on the glaciers. Eventually he brought Helga back from Greenland, but she pined for her lover and could not stand to stay with her father. When called upon, he rode out alone to save Ingeld of Ingeldsquot, who had been lured to a dangerous fishing spot by a troll woman and kept there by a mysterious fellow fisherman who called himself Grimur and whom people thought must have been Thor. He and his brother Thorkell are said to have eventually made peace and lived together for a while. From the story of Bárður we can deduce several things that are consistent with other troll stories. First, the giants, humans and trolls must have had similar enough genetic makeup for them to mate and beget offsprings together, in a similar fashion that early Europeans, which before were referred to as Cro-Magnon man, were able to mate with the Neanderthal people, even though they are considered two different branches of humans. Secondly, the troll race is in trouble. There are far more female trolls around than male trolls. Trolls lived much longer than humans, but they also had a lot fewer offsprings. In most of the stories, the female trolls are desperately trying to lure human males to live with them. The question we must answer is why? Although not mentioned in the story of Bárður, Trolls were known to be nocturnal creatures and could not withstand the light of the sun. The heat of the sun would cause them to be petrified. Petrification is the process by which organic material becomes a fossil through the replacement of the original material and the filling of the original poor spaces with minerals. This meant that trolls could only move freely about in the night. Male trolls were known to be even more aggressive than the females and more reckless also. When troll couple lived together, it would be the male that was responsible for bringing food to the cave. Trolls were exclusively carnivorous, and since Iceland did not offer much game, as the only indigenous wild mammal was the arctic fox, trolls had to go far from their hot caves, all the way to the ocean to catch walruses, seals, whales and large fish, like halibut. The other alternative was to steal animals from the farms, cows, sheep or abduct humans, for they also have developed a taste for human flesh. It was their practice when they managed to capture a human to take them alive to their cave and fatten them before they feasted on them.
It is therefore likely that the male trolls became extinct long before the female trolls did, being caught in the sun, struggling to get to their caves before sunrise and not succeeding. In Iceland, you can see in many places the evidence of this. On the mountain sides and by the coastline, we have many petrified trolls that still resemble their form, though the bitter winds and harsh blizzards have managed to erode some of their original features. Yet another factor must have contributed somewhat to the demise of trolls in Iceland. They were incredibly ignorant and stupid, and therefore very argumentative. This is demonstrated in the story that Tolkien shares in The Hobbit. As Bilbo and the dwarves are caught by trolls, Bilbo starts to argue how best to cook the dwarves and the argument lasts until dawn and seals the trolls' fate. Another indication of their low intelligence is the troll practice of keeping their spirit and life force inside an egg. The egg, however, was very fragile, and to make things even worse, their favorite game, as they spent the long, bright summer nights and the days, inside their caves was to throw their live eggs between themselves like a ball. If they failed to catch the egg, it would of course break and their life force would drift away and cause them to die. This would also give the captives, if they had them, an easy way to kill them. All they had to do was to find the egg, usually not well hidden somewhere in the cave. Trolls are supposed to have been offended that Christianity was adopted here in Iceland and have tried in many ways to impede its growing following as they settled nearby where Christianity was adopted and church built. And if they didn't have their way like they wanted, they tried to drive the human crazy and seduce them from Christianity to their own religion. The Icelandic people have, however, found a way to reconciliate their religion with their belief in trolls. And the best example of that is the story of the Yule lads and their parents, Grilla and Lepanudi. One of the things that makes Christmas in Iceland very different from most other Western countries is the absence of Santa Claus. In his place, we have 13 Yule Lads. The Yule Lads appear in old stories and folk tales. Historically, the Yule Lads and the other Christmas spirits were meaner and more evil. But beginning in the 18th century, then especially during the 19th century, they became more gentle. In the 18th century, royal decree about religious practice and domestic discipline, parents were banned from disciplining their children by scaring them with horror stories of monsters like the Yule Lads. The Yule Lads maintained their old habits of mischief and petty theft, but their appearance changed. Old stories described them as monsters with little resemblance to humans. But by the 19th century, they had assumed a human form. When wealthy merchants began hosting public Christmas tree balls and dances, at the end of the 19th century, the Yule Lads had become friendly old men who brought treats. Since the 1980s, the National Museum of Iceland has invited preschoolers to come and meet traditional Yule Lads. 
that was helping to eliminate the American style red clothing. The kinder you lads first appeared in the towns and villages, while their evil characteristics survived longer in the countryside. However, their transformation had been completed by the 1930s, when the Yule lads began making regular visits to schools and making appearances in, on the radio to tell children's stories and sing Christmas carols and songs. Originally, the number of Yule lads varied. There were as many as 82 different lads and trolls. In the 1860s, as the stories of the lads are being collected, their numbers, names, and characteristics are being standardized. At the same time, their numbers shrink to 13, corresponding to the 13 days of Christmas. Today, the Yule lads dress in traditional Icelandic peasant wear. But for most of the 20th century, the lads all were red, like the American Santa Claus. The reintroduction of traditional dress was made by the Icelandic National Museum in the 1980s. In 1988, the museum began inviting children from Reykjavik schools and preschools to the museum in December to learn about history and meet the Yule lads. And of course, the museum lads wear traditional clothing. The Yule lads are examples of the dark spirits of nature, which take over during the winter as people retreat indoor. Outlying mountains and heath cabins used during the summer are abandoned in the fall. One by one, the Yule lads then come down from the mountains until the entire crowd of trolls are, have descended upon the farm and towns on Christmas Eve. Nature and its uncontrollable spirits have reclaimed the land. Then one by one they retreat back to the mountains, just as darkness retreats, and the days get longer. The characteristics of the Yule lads which appear in names like Sausage Swiper, Meat Hook, Skier Gobbler, offer another hint to their origin as reminders that people must take care of scarce food during the winter. Sausages, smoked lacks of lamb, skeer and milk can disappear mysteriously if they aren't kept under close surveillance. The Yulna's mother is the ogress Grilla. Grilla is one of the oldest mythical characters in Icelandic folklore. She is mentioned in the 13th century manuscripts, and we can also find Grilla in the Faroe Islands and a closely related ogre in Ireland. She is closely related to the fear of hunger. She is always hungry, and she threatens to snatch away children, usually the naughty ones. As the Yule lads became gentler, Grilla remained evil, keeping the old tradition of evil Christmas spirits alive. In old stories, she has many hats, eyes in the back of her head, she is bearded, she has fangs, and a tail and hoofs. She is an actual monster. Grilla is accompanied by two other evil creatures. The lesser known is her husband, the troll Lepaludi. Grilla is often shown beating and berating her husband. According to the legend, Lepaludi is the third husband of Grilla's. She killed and ate her first husband, Guster. Her second husband, Bole, whom she also murdered, after having had a large number of troll children by him, The Yulets are, however, the children of Lepaludi and Grilla. In some stories, both Grilla and Lepaludi have perished from hunger because there are no naughty children anymore. Grilla's other companion is much better known, the Yule cat, Yula Götterin. The origins of the Christmas cat is more mysterious than those of Grilla and the Yulets all of whom are clearly 
traditional trolls or mythical spirits living in the mountains. The earliest written records of the Christmas cat date back to the 19th century. But he seems to be closely related to the Scandinavian beliefs in the Christmas goat. According to the story, the Christmas cat will snatch and eat children who don't get new clothing for Christmas. This belief is probably connected to the tradition of everyone getting new pieces of clothing for the holidays and the custom of farmers giving their farm hands new clothes each year. It may also be connected to the pressure that people were under to finish weaving and knitting before the holidays.